Buddhism, Hinduism, Tantrism, they're all the building blocks around which this entire society is built. It's so complicated. There's 330 million Hindu gods and goddesses. For me, Hindus were in India, Buddhists are pretty laid back cats. Tantric people were doing things in the bedroom that I could only dream of. All of that was wrong. Well, some of us right, but <laughs> there's so much more to all of it. And don't expect to get your head around it if you come here for a couple of weeks. I had all manner of experts teaching me about it. 1,000 manifestations of Lord Buddha, uh, known as Sahasra Buddha Lokeshwar. All I realized was that there is so much more that I don't know. It's very confusing for Westerners. I thought the hustle and bustle of Kathmandu was just purely inescapable. It's everywhere you go until we got to Port Enough. It's magnificent 1600 year old Buddhist stupa, a focal point for people here in Kathmandu to come, do a clockwise circle, give offering and thanks. It is truly astounding. It's called the stupa. If you take the aerial view of this stupa, it's going to exact in the mandala platform. Mandala is the mission of Lord Buddha, symbol of wisdom and compassion. This is the getting the happiness, inner happiness. It was one of the great sites that encapsulates the spirit of Nepal. And the people there and the way they react as they give offering, you just wanted to be a part of. And that feeling of enlightenment and power that they were drawing from this place. I could feel it rushing past me, but I couldn't jump into it. It overwhelmed me, and that's why I felt sad at that time. This morning has been overwhelming, so a cup of muscle of tea, definitely in order. We timed it really well coming to Nepal because February includes the month-long Swastani Festival, which is about an hour's drive northeast of Kathmandu. That's on a good day, of which there are none. This temple, this temple now. Did not know what to expect. Basically, this is a, a month-long festival where people come and bathe on the banks of the river. You get closer, the crowds get thicker, and there's a real fervor to the whole thing. There were bands playing or groups singing, and people were buying things that they could use to give offering. Safe to say, it was busy. Of course, it wouldn't be a Hindu festival without a welcome super dragon train, naturally. We set off down this set of stairs and there were people crowding five, six deep along this section of river, diving into the water. And what I noticed was despite there being so many people right next to each other, everyone was in their own zone. Because for them, despite everything else was going on, it was just a moment between them and the goddess and it didn't matter that there was someone standing practically on top of you on this side and this side. There was so much colour and movement. Standing here amongst all these people, I've, I've never felt so out of place. I'm, I feel like I'm intruding on something that's so sacred. You can feel that sense as they give thanks. It's a privilege to be a, even a part of it, to watch it. Everyone in Nepal has a difficult time by Western standards. And the Tibetans have had an incredibly difficult time. We arrived at the Tibetan monastery uh, in Pokhara, uh, a refugee camp. So these people uh, who are living now here in this settlement, from Tibet to Nepal, they came through uh, crossing all these Himalayas, these mountains, on foot. But 1962, the people who are living here, they decided, why not they live here? China invaded Tibet in 1950. The Dalai Lama fled the country through Nepal and into India in 1959. And from the 60s onwards, he was followed by hundreds of thousands of Tibetans fleeing Chinese persecution. This is a monastery. Monastery means where the, the monk, monk means boys. They eat here, they study here, they practice here. Everything is happening in this very place. The inside of this monastery was just a riot of color and iconography of hundreds of years of history and the culture of Buddhism. 
Buddhism is very suitable for the Western people because Western people are very skeptical, very critical thinkers. It's based on why, reason, not based on faith and belief. So that's why now scientists say Buddhism is not a religion. It's a science of a mind. And as if we weren't overawed enough, we were so lucky to be able to speak with one of the monks there. Can you explain the idea of achieving enlightenment? Enlightenment is one mind which is already out of suffering and which is already out of illusion and ignorance. That's that is the goal? Yes, yeah, that is the goal. But uh, when, we don't know. What, what are the Four Noble Truths? Yeah. These Four Noble Truths are very uh, reflecting on our own life. If you are a very qualified, complete investigator, then you can find every Buddhism teachings in yourself. Inside yourself. Buddhism is all about life, and it is for life. You couldn't have been there and not wanted at least a part of the calm that he had. What he had, I want to take it home with me. To place the priority that they do on religion and to make it a, such a joyful, personal and harmonious thing. I didn't expect my mind and my being to be battered and for me to be so open to that happening and want it to continue to happen. Every bit of this journey has changed me a little bit and I keep saying I want to hold on to that when I go home. Everything about this place leaves an impression on you that you don't expect and makes you look at yourself in the most basic fashion and think, what do you hold important?